Film Trace. This is a podcast where we trace the life of a film from conception to production all the way to release and reception. It is season five, episode two. We are picking a movie that is newer to streaming. And what is this on? This is on Showtime, isn't it, Chris? It is uh, streaming on Showtime, which is uh, surprisingly got a pretty decent selection lately. I'm not sure if they're uh, bumping up their game to compete with HBO or what, but uh, the content wars. Uh, yeah like. <laughs> yeah but they've got uh, it's, they've got a pretty strong selection especially i think of like 90s and 2000s films that you typically wouldn't uh find on like netflix or hulu yeah so we're going to talk about uh the 2011 jason reitman directed diablo cody written young adult uh starring charlie Theron, Patton oswald patrick wilson elizabeth reeser among others um th- this is my choice um i'm gonna ask myself dan why did you choose this movie <laughs> someone had to ask it of you yeah exactly right so um there was something about so every year or every season when we do this we go through and pick movies that have an anniversary this one obviously is a 10-year anniversary um and the goal when we pick these movies is sort of like what would be one interesting to talk about for both of us um and two is there something about this movie that has been sort of forgotten or lost or does it need to be re-evaluated in a different way? Either it's a huge movie like American Werewolf in London um, where we th- think about it in a different way, you know, 30 years later. Was that 40 years later? Yeah, 40 years later. Mm. Um, and this one's only 10 years old. I picked this because I felt like it was a movie that came out when Diablo Cody and Jason Reitman were kind of near the peak of their fame, at least the first part of their careers. And it felt like it landed with a massive thud. Right. Um, and you have Charlie Theron, who, of course, is, you know, Academy Award winning actor, um, comedian Patton Oswalt, Patrick Wilson, who is wonderful. There's just a lot of elements here that should have worked uh, in terms of it being popular and landing a lot more. Uh, and it never really happened. And I think for me personally, <clears throat> you know, I have seen Juno many times uh, and I've seen Jennifer's body many times. And I had never really dove in into this film. Um, and so was, I was just interested in to, to reconnect with it and see if there was something there that I had maybe missed on first watch. Because when I first watched, I was like, I don't, I was not connecting with it at all. Um, I don't know if that was that the case for you, Chris. I mean, how are you coming into this, um, this episode? Yeah, I have very um, negative memories of seeing this film when it first came out. Uh, and I, I do have to admit that there was some like baggage, I think, residually left over from uh, Juno for me because it was yeah. incredibly hyped, especially here in Minneapolis, where I'm located, uh, yes. since that's uh, Diablo Cody, screenwriter Di- Diablo Cody's hometown. And uh, it was set and partially filmed in uh, Minnesota um, as as was this one, uh, Young Adult. So it was, uh, I'm not sure, I feel like perhaps, I mean, you know, I was in my 20s, so I was literally just seeing anything that came into the movie theaters back in 2011 um, and uh, didn't have kids yet. So it was just kind of like a no-brainer that I would go see it even if I perhaps didn't really have much interest in it. Other than the fact that, like, I mean... Charlie Theron and Patton Oswalt. I feel like maybe that was what sold it for me in terms of going to it because I wasn't particularly enamored with Cody or Reitman. Um, and it was just like a real bummer of a theatrical experience. Oh, I can imagine. I never saw, I don't think I ever saw it in the theater. I think I saw okay. it on like HBO or something like that one right. year after it came out. Um, I am really interested in a good way maybe to dive into the film deeper. Uh, as you know, someone who was a young adult in Minneapolis, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And Diablo Cody, I imagine, was just like a thing, right? right. Um, I, I kind of would would love to hear sort of um, your thoughts on her and kind of the Juno, um, you know, Jennifer Body stuff. Like, where where do you sit with her? Do you <laughs> do you like? <laughs> is there like because um, she has a very creates very strong reactions in people. I feel like yes. Definitely. What are your thoughts? Um, I so I will admit that, like, I was 
like so many people, especially those here in Minnesota, kind of swept up by her rise to yeah. fame in the mid 2000s. Um, I mean, I remember like reading in the, you know, paper of record, the Star Tribune here in the Twin Cities uh, about like her meteoric rise to, you know, Hollywood and how she, you know, convinced um ivan reitman's son to like at that time like you weren't jason reitman wasn't a, a known quantity by himself uh he was still ivan reitman's son because i think he had was when that whole deal happened like thank you for smoking reitman's reitman jr's first film had just come out uh and it was just like kind of it was a huge buzz uh diablo cody had written a nonfiction memoir about being a phone sex operator um, that had kind of flown off the bookshelves, um, at least locally. And then she uh, wrote uh, freelance for City Pages, which is like the alternative weekly newspaper here yeah. in the Twin Cities. And so like, and obviously with that name and with that personality, it's just like, that's exactly the kind of, uh, you know, um, left field uh, kind of persona that will uh get you the talk get you to be the talk of the town so when i went into juno i was excited like i was uh really thinking that it would be a, a fun look at you know minute like kind of like what the coen brothers did in the 90s for yeah. with fargo right um uh and of course the kind of big uh side effect of uh fargo is that you've got tons of passive aggressive minnesotans saying like that's not what minnesota is actually like and it they didn't really get the joke right of yeah. uh, how they played with you know stereotypes and what have you but i feel like it was potentially at least maybe because i've lived through it more because i wasn't in minneapolis in the 90s uh it felt so oversaturated and almost like absurd i was i i i feel like i want to say bordering on grotesque <laughs> the way that uh people talked about and uh just like became obsessed over specifically her like screenwriting voice yeah. in juno yeah. and the representation of uh like small town life in minnesota and it was it's kind of that same thing except i feel like with coen brothers it feels so much more obviously like uh a joke yeah. but then it and diablo cody very much seemed like you know that that city girl that uh, was really kind of looking down upon the, you know, small town life of sub like suburban and like outer rings suburbia in Minnesota with Juno. And I, I didn't hate Juno. There was definitely parts of it. I liked a lot. Um, once again, mostly has to do with the cast. Yes. Uh, yeah. But it, it overall still left like a bad feeling in my mouth. And uh, it, yeah, and, that's super interesting. Cause I just, viewing it from someone who you know was not living in minneapolis like i can only imagine because outside of minneapolis juno landed with like uh, like an atom bomb landing like it was right. massive culturally especially for younger people uh, this would be like millennials like i mean you know, maybe older millennials um and uh yeah it must have been sort of just incessant the hype uh mm -hmm. i didn't even like so you had a good understanding of who she was even before going into juno Right. Oh, so that was, yeah, she was, she was very much her own personality and, uh, it, but it, like, it was definitely the, the fact that she sold that screenplay, right. That yeah. was, that, uh, that made her become the talk of the town. So, I mean, I'm curious, like what, what's, what's your relationship? Cause I didn't actually see Jennifer's body until several years later because I had kind of a, uh, a strong negative reaction to juno yeah. um and uh and i i do i like i i saw it maybe five years after the fact and i did i i think it's probably the best of these first th this first trilogy sure. of diablo cody films mm -hmm. um but uh i'm curious where where you were when you eventually saw young adult um with regards to both diablo cody and jason reitman i should add quick that i also kind of had maybe another reason why i wanted to see young adult especially in the theaters is because i actually very much enjoy reitman's 2009 film up in the air yes george clooney and anna kendrick um, right yeah i mean it's uh, I, I think it's it's super hard to overstate like the juno impact i think on everybody when you if you were like in your 20s mm -hmm. it just was like i 
everybody saw it. It was like a cultural phenomenon, even outside that generation. I think for older people went to go see it, like our, you know, boomers went to go see it and thought, thought it was funny and interesting. Um, you know, it was nominated for Best Picture. Jason Wright was nominated for Best Director that year for <laughs> Juno. Uh, Diablo Cody won. This is her first screenplay ever. She won the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. So, it, you know, it was just so massive. Um, and there was going to be an inevitable backlash. And for me, I went to go see it. I really liked it. Did not really love the what could border on, um, let's say, a very, very light pro-life message uh, of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Diablo Cody even says now that she kind of regrets, like, adding that sort of verve or accent to the film. Uh, but yeah, I think for me, it was sort of like, this is really good and interesting. The dialogue is amazing. I'm not buying necessarily that it's like this really great film. Yeah. Um, and then Jennifer's body comes out. I see it in the theater in 2009. Um, v- hated it. Absolutely <laughs> hated it. I mean, obviously I'm a horror, a horror, uh, nerd. Uh, if you ever listen to the podcast, I talk about it all the time. So it just was not my cup of tea in terms of a horror film. I thought it was messy. I thought it was very poorly directed. Uh, the script was okay. Um, just a lot of, you know, the thing with Dab- Diablo Cody, she has a very specific voice and you get it in Juno, you get it in all these movies. Uh, very less so in young adult, I would say. Uh, a lot of pop culture references, fast talking, um, a lot of slang. Uh, and that was kind of like her voice. And then, um, you know, Jason Reitman, I loved Thank You for Smoking. Absolutely loved it. Um, obviously, I had sort of interesting feelings about Juno, positive and negative. Up in the Air is one of, was one of my favorite movies. It no longer, no longer is. Um, and then you get to young adult. So, you know... I was excited that they were re-teaming teaming up again to sort of do something. I was very skeptical of Diablo Cody's voice at this point. I was sort of like, ah, I don't know if like she's going to be able to pull this off. And when I saw it, I was like, this is just more kind of edge. I would call it edge core, as they say, <laughs> or edge lord. <laughs> like um, you know, something like that where Diablo Cody is trying to say something interesting and cool and it's, it's not happening. That's how I kind of came into Young Adult. I was like, this is not it's dour it's maudlin it's um you know it's trying to be profound it's pretentious and all these different things and so you know i don't know like it it essentially when it came out i think there was just a sort of like a a big shrug with a lot of people it's Mm -hmm. like eh, this is supposed to be sort of the re you know the juno sequel type thing here where they're they're getting back together and it just did not land at all with the same type of um explosiveness as juno did i mean it is kind of an interesting sort of concept that how this came to be so you know diablo cody essentially because of her success from juno and jennifer's body to some degree which was not a huge box office hit but whatever uh she got it made which is a success um she started to get a lot of questions in the press about why do you always write about young young people Mm-hmm. And I think that Diablo Cody essentially says in a lot of interviews, she sort of like reflected back on herself and is like, well, why do I write a lot about, um, you know, younger people? You know, what is it about me? Uh, and then a quote from an interview, she goes, why do I? Am I having problems growing up uh, that I need to live vicariously through these young characters? Uh, she started writing, projecting my own fears onto Mavis, who is the lead character of Young Adult. Uh, and then she started to grow into a dark manifestation of the worst person I could be. So it's a really sort of interesting starting point for this script, which, again, was not written with any sort of studio in mind. No producer is being like, you need to write, you know, it's not a spec script. It's just her original idea just going for it. Um, Starting from that place, it's like, "Mm," looking back on it, um, I would not have picked that up when I was first watching it at all. I would have just assumed that it's like Diablo Cody trying to be interesting and, and edgy. Um, but when I've watched it again, you know, for the first time in probably about a decade, um, you know, it, it, it felt very different. It felt very mm, exposed and it felt very confessional. Um, and I think you can kind of like get that a little bit as you sort of read the interviews and these are contemporary interviews, I think, you know, when it was coming out. Um, but there is a sort of, um, There is uh, an element here where it does feel like Diablo Cody is kind of laying herself bare a bit, not completely, 
uh enough for it i think it adds a little bit more meat on the bones than you would have seen in a juno or jennifer's jennifer's body it's a little bit more self-reflective i would say um we didn't even talk about the plot should we talk about the plot yeah let's let's, let's make sure we got this go for it. log line out there uh charlie's play theron plays mavis gary a successful writer of teen literature who returns to her hometown with a dual mission one to relive her glory days and steal away her now married high school sweetheart too However, her mission does not go exactly to plan as she finds her homecoming more problematic than she expected. Instead, Mavis forms an unusual bond with a former classmate who has also found it difficult to move past high school. And that's Patton Oswalt's character. Yeah. It's, uh, we, we were talking, I feel like recently, and I cannot place what episode it was, what movie it was about this whole kind of subgenre of the homecoming movie of okay. these characters that was it home for the uh, holidays or something maybe um, um uh, it also might not have been podcast? sure it also might not have been a podcast at all because i believe we rewatched garden state uh yeah, recently maybe yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. it was the conversation yeah. we had regarding that film which also is has some kind of interesting other similarities besides the plot um to young adults where uh you have this kind of insufferable protagonist um that is uh, has some kind of compelling either desire or otherwise pull to return them to their hometown. Yeah. And uh, I think it's especially a tiresome plot mechanism. Um, it, at least it was in like the 2000s, early 2010s. And that's, I think, the first thing that for me uh, went wrong with this movie, both in when i originally saw it 10 years ago and when i rewatched it this past week i just felt and maybe that's part of uh the age thing um yeah i i had no desire in my 20s to like think about uh what it's like to return back home and i still don't in my 30s where are you at with that personally not oh, to make this into a therapy the podcast <laughs> i think about that all the time <laughs> Interesting. Like, yeah, because you know, like I, my family still lives essentially where I grew up, right? Um, and so where we grew up, and right. um, I go back, you know, obviously for pandemic, once or twice a year at least. And every time I go back, there is this, um, and it and it gets more and more accented over the years. Like growing up in Wisconsin, where we grew up, but we're in the Midwest, so it's definitely kind of in you know the same realm as Minneapolis and Minnesota. Right. Uh, and Diablo Cody grew up technically, I think, uh, when she was younger outside Chicago in a suburb. At least that's where she was born. Um, and uh, so you know, comparable. Um, every year I go back, the more and more I realize um, that like. I 100% don't belong in a place like that. <laughs> right. And it's like, it's for me, this homecoming thing, and especially when you feel like you're kind of an outsider and didn't belong there. Uh, and you go back, like to me, that hits home every time. Like when I go home now, back to Wisconsin, my parents live out in like Heartland and, you know, which is like, you know, basically 40 minutes outside to the West of Milwaukee. It's not even really a suburb. It's more of like a, a small little town. Uh, yeah, I just get this weird when I, you know, when I was younger, probably the age that um, the, the character is supposed to be Mavis in this movie is supposed to be. It was a lot edgier, right? It was a lot more standoffish. Yeah, you know, but you, you bring that up and I, I took specific note in my rewatch. She's 38. The character oh, is 38. Is she? That's which oh, is that's really interesting. I thought she was younger. That's what I originally had thought. But then when she says that at like maybe the 20 minute mark or so of the film, I'm just like, wait, what? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, well, I think that like and that kind of hits at a point that that um, Diablo is even talking about here. Like, you know, if you look at her life when she's writing this, um, you know, she was, I think, married in 2009, had her first kid in 2010. Uh, so she had a pretty stable, I would say, like domestic life when she's writing mm -hmm. this. And a lot of it feels like, and she kind of says this to some degree in the interviews, like, these are like my worst fears about myself. And like, if I, you know, it's almost like if she had not, you know, done the marriage thing and you know, had a kid and done, you know, settled down, so to speak, like this is the path she could have become in a way. 
you know, like late thirties, um, you know, it, it's, it's also a tough character. Charlie Theron's, by the way, amazing for taking this on. It's a Absolutely. very tough character to sell, uh, especially as a protagonist, you know, she's mean. She is judgmental. Uh, she doesn't really seem to have any friends. Mm -hmm. um she's totally isolated she's alone she's a miserable human being that is super tough to be around um and you know that's a that's one of the toughest pr protagonists you could create um and, and i kind of wonder you know in the conception of this you know do you think that well number one how do you feel about that in general having such an unlikable protagonist can it work is it probable to work? Um, and then two, how do you see it playing out in this movie specifically? Yeah. I mean, this is something that I've definitely feel like I've grown uh, to appreciate more over the past 10 years. I feel like I was definitely in my twenties as a like, movie lover, very much like thinking like you either have to be, you have to have some kind of shred of empathy uh, for sure the protagonist to make it work. And I don't necessarily think that's true anymore. Um, I also think that uh, that whole analysis gets super complicated with, uh, you know, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched Young Adult, I think it's worth watching. It's on Showtime right now. And come back and listen to the rest of the cast. But it's made comp even more complicated by the fact that we are finally given uh, something to empathize with uh, Mavis's character about, uh, you know, in the final act of the film when it's revealed that you know, she uh, had a miscarriage with Patrick Wilson's character, the guy who's uh, who's magnetized her back to her hometown that she's hoping to reconnect with. And uh, and that I mean, we can talk about that reveal later. But if you take that piece out of it, there's literally nothing else. Right. That really makes us care yeah. about her other than the way you care about somebody who is an alcoholic and wish that they weren't, or you care about the way you wish, you know, somebody that uh, is mean to people, um, you wish that, you know, you know that for every bully, there's some kind of backstory that, you know, makes you think that maybe they're just recreating a cycle of abuse. Um, but other than that, it feels really hollow. And you made an interesting comment earlier about uh, that whole, like, um, almost, like, I don't know if I, I, I feel compelled to say, like, uh, like a neoliberal pro-life message of Juno. Yeah. And yeah. especially when bringing together the personal life of Diablo Cody uh, leading up to the writing and creation of this film, uh, it feels like a, a neoliberal endorsement of settling down of like having a traditional domestic household household uh, because it very much feels like almost the opposite of, you know, and maybe maybe actually it also is affirmed um in Juno to some degree uh by the fact that like there's still like w we're supposed to like on the outside view uh Patrick Wilson and his wife uh their characters as like oh they're small minded because they're stuck in their hometown he works for General Mills and mm -hmm. has a boring life but then you know we're by hey, at the halfway mark if that we're kind of almost trained to instead have the reaction of oh they're actually happy and maybe should just leave them alone <laughs> like let them have their happy simple life and i feel like that's just that that is one of the things that continued to rub me the wrong way both when i saw it in my 20s and now watch rewatching it in my 30s and i say that as a guy that has a relatively yeah. simple boring domestic life i just i just hate when that's um is kind of represented on screen yeah well i think that like that's one of the things that um i will say this about the movie i don't think that there is and this kind of goes a little bit into like what they were trying to create there is not a thesis statement to this movie <laughs> it, it doesn't exist it is yeah. very um emotionally convoluted from the art the artistic and the creator's perspective um, I do think that there is this element of, yeah, romantic romanticization of um, Buddy and his wife's life and their new kid. And, you know, and it juxtaposed against Mavis's, you know, um, 
complete isolation and alienation from other people, essentially. Um, but I see that more as a reflection of Diablo Cody in sort of where she is at a writer at this point in her life than I do about sort of, you know, you, we could say she romanticizes the domestic small town life, but ultimately Mavis turns her back on it. Um, and you know, there's also this moment of sort of connecting with another person at the end, Matt's sister who kind of idolizes Mavis and had since high school on some level rejects her too. Like even like even the smallest little um, connection with another human being friendship, you know, she wants to move to the city and wants Mavis to show her around, but she's like, no, you're, you work better here. Like she's a character in one of her, in her books. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. And I think that that reminds me of kind of what Richard Brody was saying about this movie. Um, (laughs) You know, who's like, I, you know, obviously I think we both have a love hate relationship with Richard Brody from the New Yorker. Um, I think so. Is he, we're jumping ahead here, but who cares? It's it's our show. We do what we want. Um, <laughs> in his review in the New Yorker, he goes: Reitman is a condescending Democrat. He treats burdened, dulled, unglamorous everyday people as a species apart, uh, but grants them that they have the benefit of a wholesome emotional life, uh, of warm-hearted sentimental bonds to the others in their leaky boats. I, I feel like that's pretty unfair. <laughs> Uh, See, I'm into it. I'm into it. <laughs> Brody, he just, he just like, but also like it, it's it's fascinating too. Like you go on to read it, he 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 almost has like this visceral reaction to the movie. Yeah. Um, which I honestly don't get because like the movie's not that it's compared to Gino, compared to Jennifer's body, compared to Reitman's earlier stuff. This is very tame. Like the smarminess of up in the air and Juno is not, I don't feel it that much here. It This feels like a very sort of depressing self-reflection more than anything. I mean, it's very sad. Like there's not a lot of silver linings in this film whatsoever. Um, and there's like, that kind of reminds me of one of the interviews that sort of talking about the movie when they're doing test screenings. There's this moment in the film where um, uh, Mavis tells her parents, you know, I'm an alcoholic and they laugh it off. And like it basically said, uh, Cody said the New York screening, uh, that scene drew stunned sympathy from an audience that recognizes it as a tragedy. Yet elsewhere, um, or most of the times that they've sat down and on a screening, that line gets a laugh. Yeah. Uh, And it's sort of like, and she goes on basically to say that that line is kind of horrifying and it is like, this is not like, um, yeah, I don't know. There's just not, there's no romantic. I don't feel like there's a lot of romanticization going on here. Um, especially not for the main character and for the other people around her. I mean, that's the one thing you could say is they're kind of like cut out board, cut out characters. You know what I mean? Cardboard characters. Yeah. Like they're there for Mavis to self reflect on, uh, and including what I mean, what do we make of Patton Oswalt's character in this? Oof, speaking of <laughs> uh, making it complicated, I, I I remember very visceral. Speaking of visceral reactions, um, very like having a almost like stomach ache reaction to the jokes surrounding the fact that he was beat up for being gay even though he wasn't gay uh when he's in high school it just it something about that rubbed me the wrong way and i think i figured it out upon my rewatch it wasn't nice necessarily as visceral in my rewatch um a lot has happened with you know how uh uh you know both uh, gay people are represented in movies as well as uh you know gay slurs are discussed and talked about in cinema but i think that there's it's part and parcel with this whole like i think you're right there's a cardboard cutoutness to like that uh that that simple um kind of representation of a domestic home life patrick wilson's character and his wife and some of the other uh townspeople including mavis's own parents but then there's also like this kind of discomfort that I mean, it's 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 cringe comedy, right? Where it's like sure. you're you're supposed to 
feel bad for him but also it is it a joke that he's not actually gay and then there's the whole question of like i i also had a very visceral reaction in the theater when mavis and pat oswald's character matt uh end up sleeping together Mm -hmm. uh there's just there's it feels so like you said there's no thesis statement it feels like just these kind of uh convoluted creative choices that are meant to make you cringe and pretty much nothing else what do you make out of it it feels so confused to me the way they present that character uh the matt character pat oswald's character yes um yeah again i think Ultimately, what I this bo- this film boils down to to me is, um, it's almost like a Diablo Cody sort of um, diary entry almost. <laughs> um, but like she's trying to imagine herself. It's almost like she's asking herself, "Do I want to be married? Do I want to have a kid? And if I mm-hmm. don't, then what is my life?" And that's the res- the result is this movie. Um, there's a lot of fear in this film. Um, Mavis is not supposed to be, you're not supposed to root for her and nobody does. She's a despicable human being basically across the board. Um, but I think that's the point, right? I think Matt's character, again, he only exists for Mavis to self-reflect in the same way that buddy Patrick Wilson and his wife and their kid exists for Mavis to self-reflect and sort of think about where am I going? What am I doing? She's always playing off of them. And there's like a great, I forget where it is here. Um, there's Reitman talks about the movie. And this is something I want to kind of like ask you too, because I don't know if I agree with this. He basically talks about the movie and says the movie ultimately becomes, says the director, a quote, doomed romance that could mean either or both take your pick. Mavis buddy, Mavis Matt. I found that, heartbreaking in the best way do you feel like that's what the movie's about <laughs> no i, I don't think feel that's... like that's what the movie's about at all yeah i mean not I mean, really it's... obviously I... the, the the plot is her trying to win back buddy her old flame but that's every that's almost like on the nose the, the subtext here i think is pretty massive yeah it's pretty loud uh i feel like Reitman's quote there is proof that Brody's quote about him being a condescending <laughs> Democrat is pretty. I think it helps prove that. Um, what a doomed romance! No, um, that that <laughs> where I feel like even especially in my rewatch, like maybe when I first watched it back when it was released, I maybe thought that like there was going to be some kind of actual like breakthrough um, between uh, either. Uh, well, I definitely think didn't think Mavis and Matt, but at least some kind of breakthrough between Mavis and Buddy. But yeah. especially with rewatch, when I knew that they wouldn't end up together, uh, or even really have much of any kind of connection besides a drunken kiss, um, that it that's not what this movie's about at all. That's like, like I think you made, you said it well. It's a everybody around Mavis serves to help her self reflect, and ultimately she throws all that away which i think is as close to a thesis statement as the movie gets but i also feel like there's this kind of um mysterious like wall set up between the viewer and the characters where we're supposed to i mean we're and that's i think ultimately i think that's why reitman's the wrong kind of guy for this i think the only kind of like uh world that he's really been i didn't like thank you for smoking by the way i i (laughs) i i i I think that it's just like too absurd and over the top and on the nose but i i think that the only world that he really seemed to understand at all was like from george clooney's character's perspective and up in the air um who himself you could perhaps describe as a condescending democrat um but this world this like especially uh, from this woman's point of view. Like I never really got what brought Cody and Reitman together because it's yeah, other than the, sure. maybe the condescending part where it's like, it feels like there's judgment going on, but also they're trying to um, like leave room for interpretation. Like the I'm an alcoholic line, but it still feels like, I think there's a reason why that line doesn't um, resonate with, you know, maybe Midwestern audiences as much as coastal audiences. I think there's, I think that's a really good microcosm or distillation of just like what's 
what the disconnect is, what that wall is between what's going on in the text versus how the audience is interpreting it. Even dorks like us that are like overanalyzing it to the nth degree. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring out the the alcoholic line. Um, it obviously was a sticking point for Reitman and Diablo Cody in, in the test screenings. Also, in the test screenings, additionally, was that there was a lot more drinking in the film. Hmm. And the the feedback that they got from the audiences was that, like, oh, this is a movie about an alcoholic. And that's why they started to cut scenes with her drinking because they didn't want it to be a film about an alcoholic. They wanted it to be a film about, you know, Mavis just being a, a dirtbag person. Um, because that would have given her too much empathy? I don't know. <laughs> like, Well, I think, I, ultimately, I don't think the film, I don't think the message that um, Cody or Reitman's trying to get across here is that, like, there's any reason for Mavis to be this terrible of a person. She just is, right? Yeah. And, like, you could blame booze, you could blame uh, childhood or whatever. She's just kind of a scumbag. Um, and... There's no silver lining in terms of her personality really whatsoever. I think that that in a weird way, it kind of leads me to one of the comments they made on the the DVD commentary, which I think was actually recorded before the movie came out. Hmm. Uh, but they basically said the, the filmmakers viewed this as a horror film of sorts as they were all in agreement that Mavis is in essence a monster trying to murder a marriage. That's from the creators themselves. I mean, it's sort of like, do you buy that perspective? The Doom Romance, it's, it, no, that's not, that's not yeah. really what this is about. Like, this is also, more about Mavis specifically. I also don't buy that one either, though, Ooh. because I, 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 I like, I was with you with just like the word horror. Like, I definitely yeah. can see this as like a horror show yeah. because of who Mavis is. But I, I, especially upon rewatch, really felt like there's no clues given to us to make us even consider for a second that Buddy would go for her um the drunken the drunken kiss is like the the smallest of morsels given to that possibility but i think that's one of the things i actually like about the film is that uh that follow-up conversation on the phone where he invites her to the party and then we find out that the only reason he invited her to the uh, baby shower was because uh his wife like begged him to and so that that reveal with patrick wilson's character like I mean, maybe that's because, like, I actually know what it's like to be a tired new dad. I feel myself <laughs> really connecting with his character this time around. Um, but I, I, I don't think that it's ever really telegraphed enough that she has any really uh, odds in her favor that she's going to be successful with any of oh, her no, it's, goals yeah. in this movie. <laughs> there's no way. Like, she's a complete fuck up, right? Yeah. Like, there's no way she might be good at like ghost writing YA novels because she kind of understands that the female teenager, cause she kind of never moved on from that part of her life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but interpersonally, she's a complete disaster of a human being. Um, and like, she's unreachable in a way. And, you know, even with the, you know, the baby shower and stuff like, or the, is the baby shower naming ceremony, whatever it is. Oh yeah. The weird um, hippie thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they, they are, they're reaching out to her. These people that she treats horrifically, Right. Uh, the reach out to trying to be like, hey, we just don't want you to be alone. We want you to be okay. Again, this all reads to me like Diablo Cody looking in a mirror. That's what really, like the whole thing. Yeah. This like so, it seems like it's like this is yeah. Uh, I want to come back to that because ultimately, if that's what's happening, and I don't I'm not saying you're wrong, because that's definitely possible. Yeah. It feels like this repudiation of being single, of living in this like having a life without like yeah i think you're right and and i feel like that's a real big slap in the face to single people (laughs) well i wouldn't say that i think that like um you know i mean i've been single for forever um and you know i think that like there is there's a fear of going down that path right, right that everybody has that like this film to me just feels like um you know it's very different obviously i think it's uh different for women than it is for men to some degree um there's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. absolutely different pressures put on um each gender right um but 
I don't know. I think to me, it's sort of like, that's why I actually love this movie mm. because it feels like this moment in time, not, I mean, the characters and stuff to me, they're all an extension of, of, of the creators here and it feels honest and it feels kind of transparent uh, and very vulnerable emotionally in terms of the writing. Um, it, and Mavis to me is a monster. She's the monster that Diablo Cody put in her head of what she would be like if she didn't have a kid and wasn't married. Uh, yeah. it terrifies her clearly. I mean, like absolute dread. Um, so yeah, a hundred percent. It it is a repudiation of being single and not having children and stuff like that because she didn't do it right. Yeah, she went mm -hmm. the other path. So to her, it's like this. Um boogeyman almost in her right. life and so that's one of the reasons why i love this movie because it's it's so to me it's so raw uh and that emotion of it is sort of like and look she's a fantastic writer and like reitman is a, is a very good director or can be <laughs> he's an always <laughs> um, ghostbusters afterlife soon coming to the theater near uh, you dude that looks awesome by the way um <laughs> i'm super stoked literally um, with a character named podcast <laughs> oh yeah i forgot about that um but yeah i mean that's my view of it but like you know, maybe we can kind of segue into like how this got received by other people. Yeah. Um, you know, came, came out in December 2011. Like, what, what was the plan there, you think? <sighs> they were they're trying to go for awards. Uh, I mean, Paramount even said had a statement sent to Hollywood Reporter saying we're employing the same strategy for this film as we did for The Fighter in 2010. <laughs> what? Like, That's... what the fuck? What? <laughs> It's so absurd. And one of the uh, articles I read too, they they're saying the same thing. This is an awards pick. Yeah, and it's just, it, I mean, especially if you look at what ended up like actually being nominated in 2011, or you know, 2012 for the 2011 80 Third Academy Awards. Um, that's that's uh, the year after the King's Speech right or is the year of the king speech i think that's right yeah so like we are in a very kind of earnest class like classicist um time period when it comes to like awards uh i feel like the mid 2000s especially you know on the heels of no country for old men and the Par the departed winning the top awards like this is a a, a time where they're starting to revert right yeah. this is you know we're we're in the middle of barack obama's uh Two two term administration, and we're not wanting anything kind of like raw, <laughs> like young adult. So right. that was that was just like a complete thematic misread on Paramount's part, I think, especially when they're going up theatrically in December um, to movies like We Bought a Zoo and New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> like nobody's looking for this kind of holiday like what <laughs> this is not a movie you go see with your family on christmas no dude this is super depressing um well critics loved it though right 80 percent, all critics 87 percent, top critics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um 70 real score on metacritic and rotten tomatoes from from the critic i mean like they loved it uh it, for the most but part it's, it it's not universal though right like it's no it's not universal but it's, i mean it's not like this is not a middling film. You know no. what I mean? Like in terms of the critical response, it's not like there were sort of, Oh, it's okay. It's a failed experiment. There wasn't a lot of that. There's a lot of like, this, this works. It's, it's tough to watch and it's right. a hard movie to get through, but no, this is a, an honest, creative sort of um, work here. Uh, audience is not, not the same. No, that's, that's a different story. Uh, so what is it? 49 Rotten Tomato score, which back then, again, you could kind of brigade something. So it's like um, not the most accurate thing ever, but like it's not good. But why would you do that to this movie? Right. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. It's not Star Wars. Um, Letterbox of a 64, which I feel is low because I feel like this film was made for Letterbox people. Do you think yeah. That? I yeah I'm, I mean that's it I I I have to keep coming back to I don't think Reitman's the guy for the job. Interesting. I I think I would have enjoyed this. I would have both enjoyed and appreciated this much more if there was some more in, someone more interesting behind the helm. I I I think about this in comparison to Jennifer's Body, sure. uh, uh, which I mean I'm curious. Do you still hate that movie? Oh, I do. Yeah, but okay. I, I will admit that Zoomers are picking up on it. 
and like make right. a cult film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I think that because you had Karen Kasama behind the camera, plus Diablo Cody, like there was a very like easy kind of match there. And for whatever reason though, like Cody and Reitman coming back together, it just felt like trying to have the warmth uh, and like almost like this sterile disconnected camera work uh like Juno had almost to the level of twee but you have such like a dour and raw script that it just I don't think it vibes together yeah. well no yeah that's totally fair I mean 100% fair I mean I the, I feel the exact opposite <laughs> I feel like the the lack of I don't know like spark in the um it, it's very even keel it's very it reminds me of like a march day in wisconsin <laughs> gray the like the snow is mostly melted there's a little bit yeah. of snow i don't, I don't want to spend soggy. i don't want to spend 100 minutes there sorry <laughs> <laughs> well you live what are you talking about you live. exactly <laughs> um audiences so didn't love this movie and no. I, you know i could see why it, it's just the general audience is never going to get on board with a film like this. I mean, it was okay. They'd like, it only shot for $12 million, which is very small, but I'm sure the marketing budget was bit, was pretty high. Uh, does $23 million at the box office. Um, I, I do want to mention that yeah. perhaps one of the reasons why they were able to keep the budget low is they, it was exteriors only were uh, Minnesota um, and on, and Minneapolis specifically just at the beginning and end of the film everything else is shot in upstate new york and there's not only is that cheaper but like they they're trying really hard to like get that outer ring suburbia feel without actually having to shoot in minnesota and of uh, of course it probably worked fine for everybody else but it very much felt to me like mercury minnesota does, is not a place and this does not look or feel like minnesota um anything with the critics that we need we've talked about brody we got to talk about your guy, Mick LaSalle. Oh, what did he say? He, did I even put this in there? What did he say? He agreed with you. He yes. said, in a seemingly casual way, Theron does something remarkable. She takes a character who should be unsympathetic, a condescending, delusional, unpleasant, amoral woman with no grace or kindness, and makes us feel for her. She does this with the help of Reitman and Cody by keying into the character's pain, making us recognize a sadness that the character herself doesn't even see. I think that's actually a really astute observation of their why theron's performance works so well and in my she opinion is one of the call. only thing yeah she one of the only call. things that helps make the film and on that note we had uh i was talking to molly longtime uh guest and good friend of the show uh about us doing this movie and she has talked uh um several times about how charlie theron can create chemistry with anybody so mm -hmm. she created a statement that she wanted me to read on the oh. air here. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so she was basically like, if I was an Academy uh, board member, every year like clockwork, I would submit the following nomination uh, for, I think, a Lifetime Achievement Award Oscar. Uh, Charlie's Theron for an honorary Oscar in recognition of exceptional contributions to motion picture arts and sciences in the category of chemistry creation. Charlie's, uh, Charlie's has proven uh, in roles ranging from indie dramas to large budget action to romantic comedies and every genre in between that she can create uh, immersive romantic and sexual chemistry with her fellow actors, regardless of age, gender, race, sexual identity, or any other factor. A rare talent making her truly exceptional, uh, a truly exceptional artist deserving of this special recognition. She's not wrong. I think Molly is 100% right. Uh, I do think she's right, but I, I, I don't. I think part of the point of Mavis's character, right, is that she has no chemistry with anybody. Mm, okay, touche, touche. <laughs> um, but I don't know. yeah, it's tough. It's like she's a monster, but she's also human, right? Right. It's like so it, it doesn't. Mavis never gets to the point where you're sort of like, I hope she dies. Right. right. I, I never got to that point, at least me personally. No, no. <laughs> you know, you're, you're never like necessarily rooting against her in terms of her getting better and being happy. You are rooting against her in terms of Buddy. Like yeah. nobody wants her to break up Buddy's marriage. Right. Yeah. That's just, if you do, it's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> anti social behavior, if you will. Uh, but um, yeah, she, I don't know. Like I, to me, 
um theron like walks this tightrope so well like mikla sala saying and it, it it to me is just phenomenal that she could even do it uh she I, I, another movie this makes me think about was what was that one she was in with seth rogan recently oh she long was, shot long shot where she plays like secretary of state or something like that mm-hmm. um she does the same thing there it's like well, how is she doing this like how is she creating um on-screen on-screen chemistry with seth okay rogan well similarly i d- i it. right that's uh, that's what i was gonna say and i still do not feel great about the creative choice of having them sleep together but i will say and i think pat oswalt holds his own too especially for somebody who's not traditionally an actor where like i at least got why they became friends right like these two damaged people uh finding a connection with each other uh platonically and so maybe that 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 goes to molly's point about the chemistry it's not necessarily always sexual it's at the very least like you get why she would want to continue hanging out with this guy and you get why matt would you know uh be happy to see her while he's welding his distillery or whatever in his garage (laughs) right um so uh let's close this out let's uh you don't it sounds like you don't love this movie i don't i have a count i i it's one of those uh films where like i admire it but i don't enjoy it I, and maybe it's not good. supposed to be a movie that you enjoy. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's that's very yeah, I think that's very accurate. It's not supposed to be you're not supposed to enjoy this movie. If you like see any sort of parallels with yourself and maybe it's like you got problems. Um <laughs> I would say this. I did not like it when it came out. I rewatched it last weekend. I think it's amazing. Uh I think it's way, way better than anything else she's ever done, Diablo Cody, that is. Um, probably the best film Reitman's ever done, although he hasn't done that many great films recently. <laughs> well, maybe Ghostbusters is going to be genius. Um, here, my prediction for this: this is going to be a Criterion edition coming out for this in ten years. Just throwing that out there. Hmm. It is going to be a slice of. It's going to be one of those films that, like, oh, this is what it was like back then, and this is going to be <laughs> one of those films. It's almost like a dystopia about what life was like in the Obama years in America, if we're still a country. Which is um, interesting because Mavis's character is stuck in the 90s listening to Teenage Fan Club, right? Yeah. Oh, man. What do we got? Uh, so next week, a new film. And I'm already mad at you for choosing this. So. <laughs> well, I want to do something unprecedented. <laughs> I want to I wanna give you the option to choose an alternative, which I have an alternative oh, lined up. This so, is breaking all the rules. Man. <laughs> yeah. If you want to stick to tr- what are you going to choose tradition or innovation um well actually you're you're choosing you're choosing probably a little a little of neither well what are my choices uh, no matter which. so okay my original plan was the prequel to Zack snyder's army of the dead titled army of thieves uh helmed by star of army of the dead matthias swigoffer um it's about safe crackers and uh, it's there's it's basically army of the dead without the zombies um which, by the uh, way, it, is a movie I could barely get through. Army yes. One it, of the most it, painful watches of my life. <laughs> so would you rather watch that? Because I'm still not comfortable going to the movie theaters. So the only other yeah. streaming new release um, we have as an option would be <clears throat> premiering this weekend on Paramount Plus, Paranormal Activity Next of Kin. Oh, my God. This is like between choosing a gun and a knife. Yeah, so real Sophie's choice. Oh, uh, man. This is brutal. I mean, like, Paranormal's probably unwatchable. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess. At least Army of Thieves will be, like, flashy and cool. Uh, I'm thinking. Um, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to ponder it this week. Oh, um, okay. So we're going to leave the, the listeners on a cliffhanger. We're going to leave them on a cliffhanger. Um, <laughs> dispense builds, you know, builds. We got to build up the drama a bit. Okay. In any event, go out and watch uh, Young Adult on Showtime for a really bad time. Uh, it could be your <laughs> Halloween horror movie if you want it to be. Uh, as always, thanks for listening. This has been Film Trace. <laughs>